I would now like to turn the conference over to Casey White. Please proceed. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, as you said, my name is Casey White, and I'm the project coordinator for the Simon Simplex Collection at the Simons Foundation. We're so pleased today to welcome both the Simon Simplex families and the Interactive Autism Network community to the webinar. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Paul Law to our webinar series. Dr. Law is the Director of Medical Informatics at the Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore, as well as the Principal Investigator overseeing the development of EAN, the Interactive Autism Network. He's an Associate Professor at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in the Department of Pediatrics. Dr. Law also has a 20-year-old son with autism. We're so excited to have Dr. Law with us today to discuss his work on elopement and wandering in autism spectrum disorders. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Law. Thank you, Casey. It's great to, to be with you and the families who have uh, logged in today. And uh, we'll be talking about wandering, and I, I'm going to be dropping the, the term elopement a lot. That's more of the, the medical term for what we'll be talking about today, but I think uh, most families refer to it as wandering, so for simplicity's sake, I'll be uh, talking about it <clears throat> using that term. I do apologize, I have a little bit of a cold, so my voice may come in and out a little bit. In case you feel free to let me know if uh, you have any trouble hearing me. Um, the, um, so wandering is one of the leading causes, probably the leading cause of death or premature death in individuals with autism, and one of the most uh, stressful um, issues that families deal with. And um, so we'll just jump right in and start uh, talking about that a little bit. Um, so here we go. So again, my name is uh, Dr. Paul Law. I'm the director of the EN Project, and I'm at which is based at Kennedy Krieger Institute, which is partnered with Johns Hopkins, where I'm an associate professor uh, in the Department of Pediatrics. And um, the, the study, many of you are part of the EN family, either uh, uh, through the SSE at EN project or the, uh, just EN in general. That's probably how you heard about this today. But uh, if we have any visitors, I just wanted uh, to uh, reiterate you know, what we're all about and uh, point to some of our resources. So, so the EN project was founded on the, um, the basis that we needed to accelerate the pace of autism research. And for that, we needed uh, to promote a community of research uh, across, across autism to um, explain research to families and, and help families or help researchers understand what families are going through to create a bridge and a dialogue. Um, and uh, we, so we created uh, a web environment to, to, um, to, to do that. Um, and uh, our, our, the most important, I think, premise that we worked labored under was that, auto, that families are the experts in autism, and we could do, do tremendous things by listening uh, in a very large scale to families and what they're going through. In this project, you'll see just how powerful uh, the, um, that relationship was when uh, this topic of wandering came up uh, on the priority list. The we there's Ian Community is the um, the website that has a lot of rich information about autism and autism research and there's a lot of vetted uh, autism uh, research um, oriented and, and articles that are vetted by uh, the experts in the uh, in the field. Uh, it's been rated very highly by individuals like Oprah and CNN. And CNN. Um, so th there's just a lot of great information there. Um, and that's sort of the, the fun part in, in, in many ways. And it's, it's also the fruit of, it's where the fruit of the Ian Research Project 
can be seen. So the Ian Research Project over on the left in purple is where families can go and join the research project. Um, it's, uh, it's where we asked all families in the United States and, and even in the world to donate a, some of their time to provide information that can greatly accelerate autism research. Uh, it's hard to explain just how much we've done uh, with the information provided by families, but it's many, 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 many different contributions. Um, and it's not just in terms of advancing science, but we work with uh, policymakers and, and advocates to, to change the lives of individuals with autism um, in, in a real-time way. And uh, for those of you who have been a part of Ian, um, we've migrated to a new system. So, um, and very, very soon you will be sent an email um, encouraging you to um, log in for the first time into the new system, and you'll have to reset your password. So don't go rushing after this talk just yet to try to get into the, the new system, although we've been uh, creating a, 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 a much a more advanced system based on our experiences with you over the past uh, few years. The Simon Simplex community, uh, which is really our host for today, is, uh, is a special community within Ian. Um, this was one of the world's largest autism uh, research projects ever, and families, uh, 2,700 families from this very large multi-site study uh, were invited to come join us over at Ian, and we help to maintain communications with those families now that that study is done, and invite them into research projects. And uh, so, so back to wandering. Um, so, unfortunately, wandering is a leading cause of death and autism. Probably, again, the leading cause. And um, uh, this is. We don't usually think of autism as a as a, a disorder that leads to death, but in fact it can. Um, in the past few weeks alone, there have been several children who unfortunately uh, have died because of wa wandering behavior. So Michaela was found dead after a three-day search in a nearby creek in San Francisco. Owen was found dead in the, in the Gulf of Mexico. After being um, after disappearing for a while, and uh, Andrew Howell was found dead in a river in Ohio just a couple weeks ago, and there's other children um, from you know uh, it's very unfortunately it's very easy to find these news reports, and uh, so going back to 2010, Nathan uh, passed away in an indoor pool. Um, and these, it does. It, take, it takes a very simple Google search, unfortunately, to find many cases of this. Um, so there have been, to put it into some perspective, although there's very limited research about mortality and autism, um, there it is twice as high as in the general population. And some of the thing, some of the uh, things that have con that are believed to contribute to that are things like seizures. Uh, certain seizure um, types of seizures are life-threatening, um, but it's quite clear that uh, the a, a light a lot probably the bulk of all of the excess mortality in kids with autism has to do with wandering. Um, but this. Uh, well, anyway, I'll move on. So, so that very fortunately, very few children experience that dramatic outcome. But what many, many families experience is stress, burden, and financial cost, and uh, from the worry, the hypervigilance they have to maintain, and the expensive in interventions and time can uh, and, and time that it takes to do these these interventions, and families just, parents are just on edge, they're anxious, they're emotionally um, just uh, very on edge from, from dealing with the safety hazard 
with very little guidance. So in response to families' concerns about this, uh, advocacy organizations came to D.C. and presented bef before the uh, Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee. It's an important federal and committee that also has many private partners, and they talked about the death, the injuries, and the stress, and said this has to be brought to the attention of uh, the, uh, the the re of the IAC and something IAC is. The, uh, with a quick way of saying interagency autism coordinating committee and um, and uh, it was very moving when I, I was there I looked across the room many people were actually crying um, which was very unusual believe me at the IAC meetings and um, because it was just totally gut-wrenching um, the stories that were presented so uh, the IAC formed a safety subcommittee immediately, particularly in government terms, um, to look into safety issues, but first into the issue of wandering. And uh, so, and the subcommittee met very quickly, and they decided that there simply was no data on this topic. There's no res essentially no research. There's a couple of anecdotal reports in the medical literature, but there was no no real research on the topic, and uh, they decided that this was a job for Ian uh, to take on. Um, so within you know by by the evening of that meeting, I was called by um, by members of the committee. And uh, we were asked to, to, to leap into action and to provide information that would help with just understanding it for proving that it was very common and uh, lending uh, towards ad advocacy efforts. So um, Ian partnered with organizations from all perspectives. Uh, one of the most amazing things about this project was there were, there were no divisions within the autism community, topics that tended to divide organizations uh, dissipated, and there was complete unity as we worked to aggressively um, get information about wandering and decide how best to respond. So. Um, the objectives of the study were to determine how common wandering was. It's hard to bring this issue to light to insurance companies, to state houses, anywhere you might want to go with it without talking about how common it was. And there was only, anecdote, there was only opinions about how common it was. Uh, we needed to determine what might be ca causing or, being, or what was associated with wandering so that practical advice could be given to families and also interventions that might be the most important could be uh, identified and, and developed. And uh, we needed to, to determine what happens to kids who do wander short of the dramatic reports that wind up in the news about uh, deaths. So, um, so we you know, we led a, a tireless group of volunteers to develop the survey. We were met on weekends. This was nonstop, um, you know, all hands on deck type research, and uh, very quickly developed a, a, a wonderful 40 item, uh, 41 item survey that was there was no no compromise at all into into the quality of the research. Um, it was just it's amazing what you can get done when you have so many people focused on a problem. So the survey was launched on March the 24th. This is just months after the initial concerns were brought up. And uh, then in April 20th of 2011, which was less than a month later, we already had results and we were presenting it back to the IAC and influencing state houses across the country. Um, and. Uh, Eventually, and you know, this is so we in, at Ian, as many of you know, we like to get 
results out quick because the process of research can take a very long time. So we didn't wait for the initial res re uh, results to be disseminated, but we did uh, do the, we always do the best we can in terms of getting our uh, findings into respectable journal journals because that provides a lasting effect in, in, in how problems can be dealt with and understood and um, be maintained in the interest of uh, the scientific and, and lay community. So, um, so when we event when we eventually got this published in pediatrics, it was quite a lot longer. But you know, eventually you have to get things accepted, and it just seems like a lot a long time compared to a lot of the other milestones. But in scientific terms, this was very quick for such a good journal. This is the best journal in all of pediatrics, and. Um, uh, it being there will serve us extremely well uh, over the years as this being the seminal paper on this topic. But anyway, so this this has led to, you know, if you want to look at it in Google, there's 8 million citations of our uh, of this paper, uh, which is hard to even believe, but we went way down. Um, one of my coworkers here went way down on this list to make sure it was still this paper or this project that was being referenced, and it was. So it's made a real difference in terms of making people aware of this problem. Who participated? All Ian research families with a child between the ages of 4 and 18. There was 1,200 children um, with, with autism that participated, and many of their siblings, because we wanted to compare. They were representing all levels of functioning, the entire U.S., all ethnic and racial groups, urban and rural. So basically, they represented the Ian family, um, which is across the whole United States. Um, and uh, this is the age distribution of those who participated in the study. Uh, folks at um, many of the families who, who join Ian are, tend to be a little bit younger. Um, so the key question that we asked was, at what ages did your child attempt to leave safe spaces or a caregiver supervision? So, we were, uh, And we spent a lot of time defining exactly what we were interested in. The core issue is safety, not um, you know, arbitrary definitions of wandering or elopement or running. Uh, we were interested in, from the parent's perspective, uh, when, when and where were children leaving safe spaces and or caregiver supervision. And um, so a supervised fit space, you know, this is the kind of image, this house, that uh, ought to come to mind. And then when you're out in public, I, I think of this in terms of, you know, radar. We have this radar as parents when we go out and we're watching our kids. And if you look at kid parents on the playground, they're checking in on their child every few seconds to make sure that they are um, still within a safe distance and engaging in safe activities, especially if the child is young or the child has autism and, and wandering behaviors. So uh, these are this is the key result that helped a lot of advocacy efforts, and that was that uh, wandering, so wandering over the age of, uh, the behavior of wandering defined by starting at the age of four or older, was half of kids had this behavior. So it's expected that really young kids wander because all two-year-olds are not safe. They tend to leave safe spaces and um, supervision. Um, so we were only concerned with kids who wandered beyond the age of four um, because that's, that's unusual, as you can see by this red curve. This red curve is the unaffected siblings. And the rate of, of parents who said that their child wandered, um, keep in mind that there are some kids on the spectrum, even in this group, um, it is really becoming quite rare, even by the age of four, certainly by five. Um, and then um, for the kids with, with some form of autism spectrum disorder, the wandering rate is high around that age of five and four, and it stays pretty high. And keep in mind that uh, kids 
as they get older, they're getting bigger. So even though the prevalence of uh, wandering is going down, uh, for those that still are dealing with this problem, it is really a challenge. I have a friend who deals with wandering behaviors in his 20-year-old who's uh, 250 pounds, and uh, that is really a very difficult situation uh, to, to deal with. Um, of all who attempted to wander, of, of all children who's, of all parents who reported their child had this behavior of trying to wander, 53% uh, succeeded and were missing long enough to cause parents significant concern. Um, you know, this is when, you know, have you seen Bobby and um, somebody realized they haven't seen him in a while and he's, um, uh, you know, he's nowhere to be seen and you have to call or ask the neighbors or run around the house in the neighborhood to try to find somebody. This isn't just somebody who darts away for a couple of seconds. Um, so, and uh, of those that were missing for for a while, uh, long enough for concern, this was a total of a fourth of all of our children had this experience, which is a very frightening experience. Um, and, but of those 26%, 31% of those kids, uh, the police had to be called to help recover the child. 65% of the time, there was an encounter with traffic or a close call with traffic that uh, may or may not have led to an injury. And 24% of the time, there was a close call with drowning. The child was found or was wading into the water or was um, had gotten through the gates to the pool or, or something like that. Um, and uh, that the uh, it's interesting that most of the deaths by far are from drowning, even though 24 uh, percent this only occurred 24 percent. Well, it's very common. 24 percent is common, but it's less than the traffic injuries. So um, we'll come back to that when we talk about what you can do to um, help protect your child. Uh, we asked about motivation, so in the in the minds of the the parents, um, what what uh, what was motivating the behavior? So parents reported that they child their children they simply enjoyed running or exploring. That was over half of the time. Half of the parents reported that tries to reach a, a place or, that he or she enjoys. Thirty six percent of the time tries to escape an uncomfortable situation or stim. 34% uh, of the time tries to escape uncomfortable sensory stimuli like noises. 30% of the time, or they're simply pursuing a special topic. So some kids will climb out of their room in the middle of the night and go down to the train tracks because they're obsessed with trains or to the comic book store because they love the X-Men or something like that. Um, children, this has to do with their emotional state not what's motivating them, but in the mind of the parents, what was their emotional state. And uh, oh, let me just go back to this slide real quick. So notice that none of these common uh, um, motivations for, for wandering had anything to do with just the child wandering by Webster's de definition of the term wandering, which is to go about aimlessly. Um, Children always have a reason. It's a behavior. It's not uh, being in a state of confusion. Um, the one air, the one field of medicine that has looked into "quote unquote" wandering a fair amount is uh, in Alzheimer's, where parent, uh, elderly individuals often do wander off and they're confused. Uh, our children are not confused. Um, parents know that. They are they are very deliberate in, in what they're doing. There's there's a motivation behind it, and that's extremely important. That's something we needed to confirm, and it's uh, it's something uh, that can be put into action because a lot because that means that a lot of times you need to talk to a behavioralist to help address this problem. For instance. So uh, back to emotional state, 
Children were often very focused. Other times they were content and playful. They're exhilarated or sometimes they're anxious. So there's different emotional states that uh, children were in, but focused was the most common. Um, other conclusions from our, our study, um, wandering is, is common and a major concern for autism families. And most families with autism, when we say that to them, they say, well, yes, I knew that, Dr. Law. Um, did you really have to do a study? <laughs> no, we really didn't. All of us were convinced of this beforehand. But, um, but in terms of unlocking services, in terms of approaching, uh, you know, edu educating people about the problem, um, working with insurance companies to provide supports and services, we have to be able to document that in a proper study. Um, better supports are needed. Families are asking for help. Um, that's actually a follow-on paper that we'll, we will do. We'll go into that a, into a little more detail. More research need, is needed, and it must in, include families, obviously, because families are the experts in not just autism, but in wandering behavior. One, uh, the, the billing code, the ICD-9 code, coding system that doctors use um, a code for autism wandering was added, uh, which over time will allow for more services to be billed insurance companies on your behalf, just like it has uh, for um, in Alzheimer's. Um, some, there's, a, there's a lot of findings that were not reported in the pub publication in pediatrics, if you read it. Um, and there's a lot of additional things that we are going to be continuing to look at. But because most of what I just told you doesn't break down between breakout, uh, you know, d um, different types of autism and, and how wandering is different. Um, but just for a taste, it was very clear that kids with Asperger's or, or parents reported that their child had Asperger's were much more likely to be uh, driven by anxious anxious situations to get away. Um, whereas parents of children with PDD and OS were more likely to be going, uh, simply enjoying running or exploring or, or headed to a favorite place. And um, so those are just two examples. But there's a lot of, but you know, all the wa wandering is not the same behavior between children, and we will have to um, be able to, it would be better if we can prof, kind of profile uh, individuals so that we can develop a, um, a plan to prevent uh, autism for each, uh, or prevent wandering for each um, profile of child. Moving on here. Um, so the other day, the uh, indirectly through a friend of mine, the uh, the uh, the new director of the American Academy of Pediatrics was asking about um, what kind of contact there was between families and their professionals, particularly pediatricians, about this topic. Were they getting advice and support from professionals? And the answer is no. So if you look at the bottom bar. 51% said they had no contact with their professionals, and pediatricians were were only you know only 14% of parents said they had any kind of communication with their uh, pediatricians about this. And this graph is of those who have the problem. It's not all kids with autism. It's of those who have a serious problem called wandering, and they're they're not talking or to their professionals about it, either because they don't feel like that's the right person to talk to or because um, pediatricians and other professionals are not knowledgeable about it. So this is just something that has to change. Schools have to deal with the problem themselves, and so they are the leading uh, source of information by a little bit. And that's not surprising. This kind of basic information, you can go to our website anytime. and. Uh, uh, look at all the other <clears throat> questions that we did not report in the paper. 
Coping with wandering, so we're almost done here. I'm getting low on time. But um, <clears throat> so because every child with wandering is so different, um, I think you have to you have to think in terms of you know, how developing approach or a way to think about how to develop a plan for yourself. And so to me, it breaks down into what can I do to prevent my uh, prevent wandering from my child? How can I recover my child if they go if they do wander? And how can I teach my children? preemptively teach my children survival skills so that if they do wander, they won't, um, they won't, uh, ha you know, have a bad outcome. <coughs> Excuse me. So these are just examples. So preventing our lock, you know, locks in the house, behavioral training, uh, fences, uh, identifying and removing offending triggers or sensory issues for recovering in, in many, many places across the country. You can call Project Lifesavers or Low Jack Safety Net um, who have websites and uh, you can register your child so that if something does happen, they have uh, information um, on your child that helps them get going and recovering them. Tracking devices can be appropriate for many children, but there's not one that that works for everybody. Um, there's a lot of kids who just don't tolerate wearing a track, tracking device all the time, and it depends on where you are, whether or not the cell service and <coughs> other um, logistics of you know, whether that tracking device will work in your area. And then, uh, but I think one thing that parents can, all parents can work on are survival skills. So teach your child to swim if you can. Kids with autism often love being in the water, and uh, so it's, a, it, it's having some fun with your child in the water may someday save their life. It's not always practical. Some kids don't like the water, and it's not always easy to gain access to a pool. Um, teaching your, your child how to navigate traffic. Uh, traffic is a complex social uh, situation for many kids with autism, and a lot of times this takes a whole lot more work than swimming lessons. But uh, the, you know, the sooner children can, can be able to cross the street safely, um, and is, the better. And I'm going to try to save my voice for some questions. Um, go to these two websites, autismspeaks.org, Family Services, and um, the, the single best site is probably what well, is, in my mind, the, the aware.org website, which um, has a big red safety box, um, which is a very comprehensive resource for how to um, go over the wandering uh, behaviors that your child might have to basically help profile your child and then develop a, a specific plan to prevent and to recover your child in the event that they do get away. Um, but it's also a little overwhelming at times. I would pace yourself. Feel free to go talk to professionals that you trust about it. And um, keep in mind that you don't need to do everything for uh, your child that wanders. It, you should, it's better and more practical to focus on the most important things to, to work on um, because not everything applies to all children. Um, but the menu of things to do is so long that it's, uh, it, it can be overwhelming for some families. So keep that in mind. And I think that is the – so I'm ready for questions. I'll take a drink of water. Thanks so much for sharing your uh, research and insights with us today, Dr. Law. Um, let's take some time to answer a few questions from the audience today. Um, so one parent is wondering if there are any sensory exercises that they can do to help prevent wandering. Sometimes her son just states that his legs need to run, which is one of the categories you mentioned. Is there anything that they can do? 
<clears throat> well, I, I think uh, I mean you when you I think um, again understanding your child specifically, your son specifically, and possibly working with an occupational therapist may be something to to consider. But um, I mean, you could probably answer that question for your son better than than me in terms of. Uh, what has worked to dampen their need to 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 move around but uh i know that uh we my son had that need and we would spend a lot of time outside going on walks and and helping him to to meet his physical exercise requirements and that helped Okay, thank you. Um, I have several parents who are wondering if you have any specific recommendations for tracking devices. As you pointed out, a, a lot of the kids don't enjoy um, the stimulation of bracelets. Sometimes GPS is really is not feasible. Um, any other specific recommendations for other things that they could use? The uh, I think one to uh, one of the first things, first tracking devices to look into would be the uh, is is the one that project lifesavers uses and it's not just that that is a superior technology but it's uh, it comes with people who have had a lot of experience using that particular tracking device and it comes with registering your child uh, for recovery efforts should that become necessary and other forms of counseling and support um, because it's I mean the beauty of, of that tracking device is it's not just a tracking device it's it's really a program it's associated with a program but beyond that and if you look at the big red safety box there are um, there are they say the same thing which is that there are so many uh, products out there in so many different circumstances, it is extremely difficult to generalize as to what is the best tracking device. Sure, that's very helpful though. Okay, I have a number of questions coming in. I'm going to try and get to as many as possible. Um, so in the graph that you showed previously in your presentation, um, wandering seemed to reduce after age five but at the end of the curve, it starts to go up again as children reach teenage years and adulthood. Can you speak a little more to that? Why might that happen, and how can it be addressed? Um, as a scientist, I would have to say, well, let's, uh, I think I can bring that up, right? So we're, where is that? There it is. Um, so people can see what uh, she's talking about. So. Um, yeah, so right here it, start, it looks like it's going back up. So the uh, if you, now if you look at this graph, you'll see that our sample size is going way down. So it's possible that the um, that these numbers are just much more susceptible to chance um, because you're you're getting down to very low sample size. So that's one possible explanation. Um, I think most of us don't believe that it's really going back up, but uh, we would. I mean, it's one of those things we would like to look into in, in our next uh, study. Now, the, but one other potential explanation is that um, parents who were dealing with elopement in these later years, it's such a problem that they were drawn to the survey at a, at a rate that others were not. So there's, there's a, what we would call in science a bias in those that completed the survey. So those are my two explanations, but I, but I can't, uh, it, it's something we would, we need to continue to look at. Okay, great. Um, all right, so the next question, 
Um, can you provide any tips for teaching kids about danger or traffic um, in a safe way? Um, a lot of parents are saying they just can't get this notion of danger to click with their children. Okay. Well, the um, the the big red box has some practical advice on that. Um, <clears throat> it depends on where your child is, where you need to. The, you know where you need to start. Does your child understand the concept of a stop sign, for instance, or cross crosswalks? I mean, are they understanding what the white person uh, in that uh, in the crosswalk sign means, or are they understanding it and ignoring it? Or um, so you have to figure out where they are, and then. Um, if they don't understand the basic concepts of uh, uh, traffic safety, you work on that first, and then, um, and then you take them out in public and uh, uh, work with them on a more practical basis. I think in the end, many kids, and certainly including my son, it took a very a lot of just spending time out crossing streets, walking. Um, different places before we eventually caught on to it. But now I send him grocery shopping for me and he walks down and you know, he he's been able to do that for, for many years now. So I think spending a lot of time with your child doing practical just walking, doing chores, the walking is a wonderful um a wonderful thing to do, and it's a step that everybody will eventually have to go through. Um. Okay, thanks. Um, I have a number of questions in the category of just wondering, this may be something we can post um, along with the video, but they're wondering if there are any kinds of tutorials for um, police, EMS, teachers, schools, um, all sorts of helping type professions and how to respond properly when presented with a wandering issue um, and related to the, um, the, also the legislative efforts that have been initiated to try and educate the population a little better about this issue. Yeah. Well, Casey, the answer is yes. Uh, it, it has been difficult for me to, to keep up with it because as the, the only researcher who's looked into this issue, um, I have been contacted by probably 40 different organizations that are trying to develop programs for their for at all levels, you know, for families. But many of them are, are targeted to um, law enforcement and uh, you know, fire, um, um, the the uh, what am I trying to say? Firemen and. Uh, Anybody who is a first responder, which is a term we use for for everybody who who is involved in responding to to missing individuals. Uh, one of the things that uh, I should have had a slide specifically for this, but um, as you as many of you know, you've heard of uh, Amber Alert, um, and so when a child is abducted, there are ways of communicating that to the public through television, through signs over highways, uh, through the local police and so forth, uh, through family members. Uh, there's, there's a whole, it's not just an Amber Alert, there's a whole program that goes, there's a whole lot of things that happen when an Amber Alert is issued. And uh, most of us just don't understand why. Uh, that type of system shouldn't exist for kids who wander. The the um, the safety concerns, the importance to uh, the safety of those children is is uh, is very very high, and uh, it is known that the chance of death is um, dramatically increased the longer the the child has been missing. So quick response is needed and an Amber Alert type system is needed for uh, individuals with autism, which I keep comparing us to in some ways. There's a Silver Alert uh, program to, to recover individuals with Alzheimer's who've wandered. So 
Um, so I think we need we need that, and it needs to be a national program. Uh, a lot of there's a lot of wonderful uh, programs aimed at educating the um, the first re responder network, but it's extremely patchy uh, by state and county and region, and it's very confusing to generalize as to what everybody's doing surrounding this topic. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and I've had a couple people also respond with some additional um, information. So I'm, what I'm actually going to do is just look at some of this information that's been posted here, and perhaps we'll try and do a follow-up um, on this topic that um, discusses some of these training programs and other things that are available. Um, I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, so this person is wondering if there are any characteristics that actually predicted a lower risk of wandering and elopement um, in your research study. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Um, they're wondering if there were any characteristics of the individuals with ASD that predicted a lower risk of uh, wandering or elopement from your research study. The, uh, uh, yes, Bas I mean, in, in general, Individuals who are higher functioning were at lesser risk of wandering, and, uh, and we actually did look into that uh, in terms of higher functioning in terms of cognitive level, um, speech, um, motor level. Sure. But okay. it, but but the uh, but it's not it, you know it's not a it, there are the the pure symptoms you know the symptoms of autism the the social the um, uh, issues um, the sensory issues all those definitely play in independently so that's why you can have you know sixteen year old who's reasonably high functioning but their their interest in a topic just won't let them go in the middle of the night and they will leave their uh their home and they can explain you know I guess what they were thinking at the time but they just uh they they can't uh not pursue that interest even if it's in an unsafe way All right. Well, thank you so much um, to everyone who submitted questions. I think I got to most of them. Um, we are, however, out of time, unfortunately.